the, the broader theme, was it the incredibly broad theme of energy, healthcare, and environment, and any questions that anyone would like to ask our speakers on these topics. Sneaky double questions won't be allowed. Thank you. Uh, the, the, gen the gentleman here. And, and then Pete with some from online. Hi, I'm, I'm very impressed with, um, with what you all presented. And um, what I'm mostly wondering, how do you interact with external partners for, who are specialists in these type of areas? Um, how do you make sure that you acquire information and look at the innovation that's happening outside and try to integrate that into the um, MSF framework and MSF operations, to say so? Is that a question to anyone in particular? Um, no, to the whole panel. Any volunteers? Whilst, whilst they're uh, composing their response, if we can have the questions, online question from Pete, please. Thanks. Um, we've got one for Matt. A study in Bangladesh indicated that higher iron levels led to lower free chlorine residual. Did you see any impact of the iron levels in Uganda? And also one for Per Eric. Sorry. Would, this, would the SOC system be more cost efficient in small hospitals, like in the one you showed in DRC, or in big provincial national hospitals with higher O2 needs? So two specific questions. Feel free to answer the first one as well while you're at it, if you would like to. So if we can start with Matt. So on the, on the iron levels, um, so it's slightly different because in uh, Bangladesh, that's high iron levels in groundwater, which is then directly chlorinated. In a surface water treatment plant, uh, it was the surface water which had high iron levels. It was then pre-treated with uh, sedimentate, well, uh, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation before then being uh, chlorinated. So actually what we were doing is uh, in the first process was removing the iron and over the course of the intervention through the year, vast, vast quantities of, uh, of iron removed from the water and then it was chlorinated. So yes, iron does have an impact on chlorination because it, uh, it will increase the, the decay of the chlorine because it uh, consumes chlorine, um, but we did not see that problem uh, in Uganda. Uh, right. Uh, I can say a little on external partner interaction to start with. Um, for the solar power installation in Shangwana, we were luckily, we'll, we had most of that uh, expertise already, although we haven't used it much in the organization. So, so that worked out well. For the SOX project, uh, that became very obvious that we, I mean, that's nothing we can develop ourselves or should develop in ourselves in the organization. So we really need that kind of external partnerships to get that forward. And maybe we can be the force to start things to provide a testing ground and then uh, assure that the product will eventually come back from, from our external partners. Uh, whether Where this would be most cost efficient, the oxygen production, I don't think there is a tremendous difference really. You know, in a way, if you compare to uh, diesel generator running uh, oxygen concentrators, um, the highest costs we would probably get in a small facility where this is a large proportion of the energy consumption, uh, then the, the liters per cubic meter of oxygen uh, would, would be higher and the cost efficiency a little bit better maybe. Uh, but I think it would be equally if applicable for, for a larger uh, facility. Uh, and especially if you could go, if we eventually could go for the high pressure uh, solutions, it would also be more, um, increase the availability through uh, the bottled oxygen. Thank you. More questions, please. We have one here. Can we get any other questions so we can get the mic in the right place, please? Your hand up if you have a question. Thank you. Get the mic back there, please. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, um, Michal is working with Watson for OCB. Um, I guess it's it's a bit of a wide question, but maybe maybe a bit more for Matt. So, um, it's it's very refreshing to see that finally OCB is uh, so MSF is going into um, less traditional uh, health um, risks when it comes to water. Uh, my question is: so I've seen around a lot of. Um, paranoia, let's say, as to um, added things into water. And then I've seen it specifically also with chlorine. I've seen people quoting uh, studies on trihalomethanes even when we chlorinate groundwater. 
so I assume you must you must have um, had some sort of health promotion campaign to go together with your handover process to the Red Cross. Um, could you share a bit if you had such challenges yourself and how do you address them? And while you're composing your answer, if we can take a question. Um, Erwan Piri, I'm a laboratory advisor with uh, MSF OCA. My question is for Maria. So besides looking outside for, for getting knowledge and understanding possibilities that are there, are we looking enough into what others are doing and are, we, are there opportunities to have other people provide energy? I mean, I'm thinking my last visit to South Kivu, some Italian NGO was putting I don't know, 100 square meters of solar panels on the on the hospital in Ubura as a, as a standalone thing. And are there more opportunities like that to be done? Because it sounds like the initial investment is scaring people off. I'm, I'm struggling okay. with that myself in, in projects where we don't have AC and everything breaks down all the time because of that. Thank you. So, so Matt first, then Maria, if you can put your hand up, if you have a question, please, we'll get you the mic. Okay, yeah, no, it's a, a, a very good point, and uh, there's a few things there in relation to that intervention. Um, the first thing is an obvious one and relates to all interventions. I mean, the risk, the health risk uh, from not chlorinating water, and particularly uh, surface water, is uh, much, much higher, um, and certainly in the immediate uh, term, and that's why I make reference to uh, you know, the quantity and, uh, and the nature of the emergency. In terms of, uh, and, and actually everyone, I mean the World Health Organization is very uh, firm on that as well in most of its discussions about disinfection byproducts, um, and certainly for this kind of uh, water treatment. In terms of the acceptance and uh, the community in that settlement, that was a very interesting one because there was another actor who will remain nameless who was trying to distribute water from a groundwater source which was not chlorinated. Uh, the population actually initially refused uh, this water. They liked uh, the water that came from the plant. They were used to the chlorine levels. And actually, to be honest, in the end, what we attributed that to was the fact that when we were monitoring in the camp in the very initial stages of the emergency, we and our, the staff with us were drinking the water from the tap stand. So the perception of the population and the acceptance uh, was, was, very, uh, was very good. Um, and actually, the impetus for looking into this issue did come uh, from an allegation of uh, overchlorination from UNHCR. We had the data to prove that we were compliant with their very own uh, standards. Um, and then on top of that, I wanted to look into this uh, issue as well. It was not something... I agree, people bring it up sometimes. They don't, quite often people don't really know what they're, what, what they're talking about, but uh, they can find some reference to, uh, to, to, to a study, et cetera. And all I can say at the end is it does get fantastically complicated. That is for sure. But uh, I still think it's an important thing to consider. Thank you. Maria, would you like to respond? Yes, um, yes. When we... Of course, when we have to decide, decide uh, what gener which energy solution uh, we are going to what we are going to provide, of course, we need to look around. No, what uh, what are the possibilities that we have, even if it's uh, city power, even if it's what others are, are doing. I wouldn't say that much, maybe, to provide uh, energy supply from other organizations because uh, we are quite uh, tricky or strict in uh, in the quality of the energy that we receive. But maybe, for example, for the maintenance strategies or for the handover process, no? Uh, there are a lot of NGOs, development NGOs, that are working a lot on rural electrification, on energy access, etc. For example, there is a, in refugee camps right now, there is a, a, a movement uh, quite uh, big right now in energy movement that are providing energy solutions. So maybe they are the ones who can help us in, in, in trainings, in materials, in, in all this uh, part that we are not so good at it, but we need it in order to, in order to to give some sustainability to our, to our energy settings, especially when we do the handover process, no? So Thank you. Questions, and this is... Uh, short questions I'm encouraging you to come up with. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, this is perhaps the, the broadest possible question, and the, the answers may not be forthcoming from the panel. Um, 
I really welcome this session. Um, I think it's incredibly important. To me, it's a, a matter of basic ethics, really, along the lines of first do no harm. I wonder if you've got any comments, anecdotes, or suggestions about potential barriers to taking up this agenda in terms of MSF organizational culture. Thank you. And you can think about that while we take a few questions from the field. I'm not sorry. I was saying. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, then, OK, then we'll allow one of our panelists to respond to that uh, whilst we take another question from the gentleman in the Yes, hi. Would anyone like to respond or would they like a little bit? Barriers. Go on, Pat. There are huge barriers in perception of what we should work with, whether this is in, in line with the emergency organization and, and all of that. But I think we got a little bit of way yesterday with the session uh, in actually concluding that, yes, we have to work with the consequences of, glo of, of uh, global warming, but we cannot forget the mitigation. We must be better at working also with that. Pete's turning to chop my head off, so uh, very quickly, yes, very uh, quickly. David Sweden Innovation uh, Unit. I have a question to uh, Maria. Um, it's, it's a question around big project versus small. Kenema uh, is a, it's a big hospital. Uh, it's a big structure. Um, is there an interest from MSF to also look at the so many more smaller structures that we have in terms of uh, uh, energy? So all the small OPDs and uh, is there an interest to look? Because I, I can imagine it's a bit of a testing project also, Kenema, how we can do it for big hospitals. Thank you. Right. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's true that Kenema is a very big project, and we we used, it was some. I mean, when we were developing the, the energy vision, it came like an operational request. So we thought, I mean, we could not have a vision without the operations involved. So it was the first big, the first request that we had, and uh, where operations was willing to to do it, to there to there to do it. No, so we we just okay, let's let's go on and uh, let's uh, let's move on and let's see what it it goes. No, but of course that doesn't mean that we only want the big projects. The idea is to put this under a big umbrella, and this big umbrella we have big projects, and but only also we have like uh, small health centers in the bush, or I mean there are a lot of uh, different uh, projects that we can tackle and. They are popping up. Huh? We just presented this one because it's like you know a fancy one, but <laughs> but there are other that are coming up, and, and of course the idea would be to, to see the differences, and also in several projects it's it's um, renewable energies can be a solution, but in other projects maybe not. But maybe we can use energy efficient efficient technologies. Maybe we can work better on how we manage our loads, no, in order to not spend so much fuel. This is also part of the strategy, no, part of the vision. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Maria. So it, it falls to me to feed back in, in two minutes, which uh, I, I will try and do. I'm delighted that this topic is, is here on the agenda and being discussed, and I thank our presenters for their uh, stimulating presentations. I, I note three things about the, the, the presentations. All three are considering the consequences of our actions and what we can do better. All three are considering what happens when we leave and all three are field-led. And this is, these three things are essential, I think, for us to consider at the strategic level as we move forward in MSF. These issues haven't been at the governance leadership strategic level, or at least in my recent experience of MSF governance, and I'm delighted to see them uh, having increased prominence here. And thank you again to our speakers. <laughs>